Hey folks, I want to talk to you about a few things. Uh, first thing I want to address is it looks ridiculous to me uh, the way Joe wanted the height of his speed bag. Uh, that speed bag is set up for somebody uh, Tyson Fury could use that speed bag <laughs> at the height that it's sitting. But uh, Joe insists that, and after debate with him, I say, go ahead and put it the height you want it. Uh, and you want to know why? Because one size does not fit all. Not in, not in this sport. It doesn't. And he likes to be working the speed bag with his hands way up, not down here. Uh, he's claiming that it's working his shoulders better and uh, his, ch his upper chest and his uh, upper arms better. Um, he's even claiming that the go out on it that way up here is helping work his forearms. So he's getting a better burn and a better work uh, with that thing higher. So if any of you see that, no, Joe is not five foot tall. <laughs> And uh, he wants the thing at Tyson Fury height. <laughs> and that's what does it for him. And that's where we ended up putting it. And uh, he's going back to when he was smaller, when he was 13. And the bags in the gym were set higher. And he was having to reach higher for them. And he feels like that worked him better. So we do that. Uh, and Joe is going to be facing taller op uh, opponents if his weight weight uh, keeps increasing like it is. Another thing I want to address with direct concerns to him, uh, I call him a heavyweight because at 14, 15, 16 years old, he is a heavyweight. Uh, well, at 16 right now, yeah, I believe he'd be a heavyweight then because he's over 190, or he's around fluctuating right now around 190 pounds. Uh, he can pack that weight on easy, and it looks good on him. It's trim, and it does not really tax in his uh, cardio that much. And we're really, you know, we're in growth stages here, so I'm kind of hesitant about keeping his weight as low as I can possibly keep it or anything like that uh, because I want him to grow as much as he can. So a heavyweight at 14 years old, which he's fixing to turn 15 next month, uh, I'll have to look and see because he's going. he'll be going up into from intermediate to juniors or juniors to intermediate. I forget those names there. A lot of you know I'm very forgetful, but uh, he's always at 176 plus, and that's, uh, uh, or has been at 174 to 176 plus, uh, which has categorized him as an amateur heavyweight. So Joe is not 238 pounds, like probably the average heavyweight weighs today. Uh, 230-ish or even 40-ish. I <laughs> don't, uh, but, so I wanted to clear that up. Next thing I want to talk about is uh, Floyd Patterson, uh, Floyd's trainers, uh, and Cus Diamato, who was a trainer of uh, Floyd Patterson. Uh, I got a post comment have no reason to doubt uh, anything that the person commented. They had commented that they were, they had gotten to spend a sp uh, significant amount of time around Floyd, and Floyd was telling them that Cuss was not the trainer, just the manager. Uh, and I have no reason to doubt that uh, Floyd Patterson told this person that. Um, and here's why. Later on in life, Floyd got very sick, and he started uh, 
uh, he got Alzheimer's and uh, had what was labeled as mild, then medium and severe dementia before then. Excuse me, folks. Let me get some water here. So, and not saying that obviously nothing negative about Floyd, but Custy Amato was his trainer. He was the chief trainer uh, of a lot of men. He was the chief trainer of Jose Torres. He was the chief trainer of Mike Tyson. Uh, uh, people may not understand that most, a lot of your, most of your successful teams, I'll give another guy, Angelo Dundee, most of your best trainers are not hands-on. Uh, they're generally older guys, and maybe when they're younger, they're hands-on in the ring, but there's a trainer over them when they're doing that. Uh, but when you get older, you end up stepping out of the ring for doing things such as uh, pad work and, and a lot of the other things that you could be doing, medicine ball work, depending upon how you'd use a medicine ball, uh, and a whole host of different things. Uh, but Custody Amato uh, discovered and brought forth uh, Floyd Patterson and was with him, not unlike Mike Tyson, was with Floyd Patterson at a very young age. Uh, and Frank, uh, I forget the guy's name, but this guy that they're mentioning was a trainer to Floyd Patterson, but he was the hands-on guy that would get in the ring or on the gym floor uh, and be directly working with Floyd Patterson. Later on, uh, not unlike Patterson, uh, when Cuss, of course, he was in, at more advanced age, but uh, you had Teddy Atlas or Kevin Rooney and some others working with Mike Tyson, and it was the same with Jose Torres. Uh, so have no doubt that the person's being honest with what Floyd was saying. However, uh, there may have been some confusion, uh, but Custy Amato got the style that he's worked on all his life that was continually evolving. There was nothing just concretely set in stone with Custy Amato. It was always... I can incorporate this thing over here. I can incorporate this thing over here and would bring it in. Uh, Cuss was uh, loyal to the style that he created. Uh, I, I would have been loyal to a style that I've created too. And we're working on something that if Joe is highly successful in boxing will more than likely be labeled its own style and if we come up with a name for it if he's that good everyone will be calling it the blank style uh, whatever we or maybe un others give the name uh, to it for uh, unlike Cus Diamato uh, now I'm going to be a little uh, uh, judgmental to Cus Diamato. Cus was more of a one-size-fits-all kind of trainer, not unlike almost every single trainer in the business today. And that's the biggest part in boxing that I see that is uh, needs war It's the biggest thing. Uh, and we could go on and name hundreds of things, obviously, that's wrong with the sport today from fighters not fighting to a, just a whole host of different things. Uh, fighters giving up in the ring, the hearts of all these guys being questioned. 
And the thing is, your favorite guy, if he's not got his head bashed in in the ring, you really don't know his heart. Uh, not talking about getting knocked down and getting back up. Anybody can do that. Every uh, Many have in the past that most of you young people aren't aware of. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm talking real hard, really getting beat down. I'll tell you somebody who did show it to us, and that was Deontay Wilder toting the whooping that he received from uh, uh, Tyson Fury in their second and third fight. That showed tremendous heart, folks. Tremendous heart. Especially that third fight. And uh, that's why Mark Breland stopped the second fight because he knew his fighter and he knew that Wilder would just keep going on till he could possibly get killed or hurt very badly. Uh, Mark Breland is a wonderful and great trainer. And uh, anybody that tells you different, they don't understand this sport at all. Period. They may understand little aspects of it, but the totality of the sport and being a good trainer, they wouldn't have a clue. Uh, if they think that Mark Breland is not a very good trainer. Now, I want to talk about another thing very quickly. When was the first time I put a pair of boxing gloves on? I'll tell you this. This would have been 1970 or 71. And me and another kid, uh, his brother moved out. He, is, uh, he had an older brother, and the brother became of age, and he was about 19 or 20, maybe even 21, but he moved out on his own. And... Uh, that kid got his brother's bedroom as a big empty room, more or less. So we would go in there and box. But we only had one pair of boxing gloves. So they were his brother's gloves. So he got the right hand and I got the left. Go figure that. And we would change up sometimes. He would let us change up. And uh, this kid was two years older than me and a lot bigger than me and he always got the best of me but we were not trying to really kill each other but he would come through with the right and knock the crap out of me and floor me here and there but not with everything that he had or he probably could have killed me he was a, a lot bigger than I was and uh, some months have went by and my dad got me a pair of uh, boxing gloves and he said here you go take these and give him the one over because you y'all been playing around with this for off and on for two or three months and my dad was like now when you go over there you give him the up and down you know and I did uh, and those are the boxing gloves where you hear me raising a lot of cane uh, that had the strike zone strip on it that helped amateur boxing judges who were not professional judges who don't do that regularly uh, and constantly through every year uh, uh, a lot of the times these people are just chosen from here and there and they're handed a little book and they read it and they think that that's not not the way to do that but that's what they do and uh, uh, the strike zone would show anyway I got a pair of gloves like that and those were the, the gloves I refer to when I'm talking about the awful judging that I'm seeing in amateur boxing today uh, and in all actuality maybe there maybe we should have those gloves for the professionals as well today uh, there's just so much going on with judging, but I don't want to make this about judging. Uh, we quit boxing, and we moved, and we moved into a tougher a neighborhood that and it wasn't tougher, 
but there were more older boys that were like three and four and five years older than me, uh, but they were still boys, uh, say anywhere from 15 to 19, 20 years old. And uh, uh, that's where I tell you the first time I, I, I got my shellacking was put my gloves on, the other boy put his gloves on, he said, all right, here we go. I said, okay, go. And he just punched me right in the uh, lower chest, stomach area, and knocked the wind out of me. And uh, that was a hellacious experience. I had it knocked out afterward, and I realized, just lay here. The world's going to come back around. Your lungs are going to open back up, and you're going to be able to breathe. Uh, but I explained getting the wind knocked out of you in another video is a highly unpleasant experience, I can assure you. Highly un uh, If the first time it happens to you, you truly believe you are going to die. Or at least I did, and others around me that, that that's, that's happened to that I've had to keep laying on their back and tell them, calm down, just calm down, it's going to come back. And uh, they felt like they were going to die too, so... Never met anybody that had that happen to them the first time in my little realm of the world that didn't think they were going to die. So it's a very bad thing. So I just wanted to state that Custy Amato, in defense of him, was the trainer of Floyd Patterson. Uh, Floyd may have said some things later that uh, maybe Floyd even thought was true. Uh, but not necessarily the concrete truth. And uh, Floyd Patterson was a great guy. Uh, I got to meet him. Uh, he, he was actually still boxing. Uh, this would have been at some point before the last fight he had with Muhammad Ali. And uh, boy, he looked spot on. And this was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, Dude had a, uh, a tank top on. Dude, the champ had a tank top on and it looked like a million and one dollars. Uh, a million and one dollars and a nice, nice guy. A nice, nice guy. So, I know I've rambled here, but uh, uh, that's my little Floyd Patterson thing. My little thing about Joe's weight and Joe's weight today's uh, I haven't weighed him in a week and a half maybe two weeks but he's he's I'll guarantee you he's in between 188 and 192 and uh, guarantee you he's falling somewhere in between that so he's a big 14 year old heavyweight and would be a big 15 year old heavyweight uh, and as you you folks can clearly see, I mean, he doesn't have fat dripping off of him by any means. Uh, so, wanted to go through that. Wanted to, uh, a lot of things we do uh, are not what the average gym owner down the street would train or tell his guys in their assembly line to be doing. And, and I get that. And uh, I wouldn't either. Uh, but with Joe, we're doing some different things here. Uh, and we're going to continue to do some different things. We are not working on just one style. We do have a lot of peekaboo type things that we do. We do a lot of bending at the waist. And a lot of these things we, we have picked up through uh, the study of guys like Sonny Liston, uh, Ali even, uh, uh, Patterson, Torres, and Tyson, uh, uh, Dimitri Bivel. I mean, we're, we're trying to look at a whole host of different things and incorporate these things. And something we're working on right now is trying to get Joe to be able to go one round, uh, really nailing it with this one style, and then completely 
flipped in the script in the next round. And we're going to try to get comfortable. I'm not so sure how much that will be of a benefit to him. But if we can flip mid-drift in the middle of a round and go from doing something just a almost completely different style over here to doing this style, uh, that will be a shocker to, to anyone, uh, amateur or professional. So we're... We're working on a lot of things that aren't your average Joe's uh, forte uh, and things that most people are doing and uh, no more than Cus D'Amato was back in the 1950s and early 60s, you know, so, uh, and on through with Torres. Uh, we do bend, uh, Floyd Patterson, uh, had a lot of back problems. The style was adjusted by the time Mike Tyson uh, started being trained in that style to really strengthen the back and some tweaks to it. And right now we're not working on tweaking uh, anything to fit Joe perfectly like a glove, uh, like a state-of-the-art glove, because Joe is uh, still growing. And we don't know what what we got and how it's going to be, but uh, if you look at Joe from behind, and this is why I go behind him a lot, because I'm very proud of the huge, massive back that he's built, and Joe actually looks stronger uh, as he's walking away from you as even that he does when he's walking up to you. And uh, so he's done a lot of work on that back, and he's very, very proud that he's built his back up so strong. Uh, although he, we have problems with his back, and uh, we go in and we go into the gym, and I'm bending Joe like a pretzel, and bending and twisting him and rubbing him, and people look at us like we're nuts, and I'm like. God, you know, instead of thinking we're crazy, why don't you try it and see if this helps you? And uh, and that's really a lot is wrong with society today. Nobody, everybody thinks what they've learned is concrete, etched in stone. You deviate one inch from what they've been taught, and they'll tell you you're either going to get killed or. Uh, you're no good, or this is trash, or you're dumb dumbs or stupid, and ignorant, and all this, and they have no idea as to what you're even doing. And that's probably the biggest, most disheartening thing uh, for me, uh, is really when, uh, which really doesn't happen very often, but sometimes we'll get a remark come through like, you're moving too much, you're moving too fast, uh, you know, you're, uh, you should never uh, bend at the waist, you shouldn't squat down, you shouldn't bend with the legs, you, I'm like, what are you supposed to do, just stand there and bend the six inches, and that's literally what they train fighters to do today, they just stand there and bend the six inch width or whatever it would be of the glove, and you know, they can't expend no more energy than that. And we're, we're working to go 15 rounds. Uh, yeah, not 12, 15 rounds. Uh, and finish as strong in the 15th round as we started in the first round. Which is monumental and never achieved. But that's what it's aspired for. And maybe... Uh, uh, it'll never be achieved if it's not aspired for, see. So a lot of things we're doing are a lot different. If you watch us and you, you see something and you think, wow, that's crazy, uh, uh, probably is crazy, uh, but a lot of these things do work for us, and uh, we've increased. Uh, Joe's naturally gifted with punching power, but... Uh, We've increased that in increments and uh, because we do things that others aren't doing, you know. Uh, our problems aren't 
him getting his face tore up or his midsection tore up. Our problems are wrist problems and hand problems uh, from where he's just blasting with every punch with the seriousness of a heart attack. And uh, so we, we're not probably nowhere do things like you would do them and uh, uh, and, and and there's reasons behind that and it is the and one of the reasons would not be uh, what that everything you're doing is wrong that's ridiculous that's crazy and uh, that is not one of the reasons why we do what we do uh, we're trying to do what works for uh, us and uh, another little guy I'm uh, working with right now and he's nowhere near the size or the capabilities of Joe and uh, I'm showing him way different way different well, why would you do that because one size does not fit all uh, you need to the characteristics that you have you need to perfect the characteristics that work for you and get them as close to perfection as you possibly can and you'll be the best that you can but if you sit there and you're trying to do what boxer X over here is doing and uh, you're I don't know five six and weigh 125 pounds and boxer X over here is six one and two twenty uh, you might want to think about adjusting what you're doing there. Uh, you know, the one boxer doesn't move like the other boxer, and one boxer stronger than the other boxer. And you could go on and on with these things, but uh, we got reasons behind what we do. And uh, but I just wanted to throw in my little spiel about Floyd Patterson and the actualities of that because. Uh, it's not good even if Floyd had made some remarks about uh, Cus to demean Cus D'Amato in any way. He's one of the greatest trainers in boxing history. Uh, he just simply is. Uh, his results prove that. One thing I really didn't touch on in this that I'll finish up with, and we're pulling up on 30 minutes of my rambling, is that uh, Floyd Patterson and Cus D'Amato had a big riff, a big bang towards the end. And that could be why Floyd was saying things maybe like, uh, Cus was never really my trainer, it was this this other guy trained me then this other guy stepped in Floyd had some different trainers and fought after and away from Castillo Mato so they were not together the whole time and there was a riff and uh, if anything could demean Cus it's that maybe Cus pulled away from Floyd Patterson as Floyd Patterson got older I don't know but I think that could be argued uh, so I just wanted to say that to to everybody else. I want to say, all my Christian brothers and sisters, God bless you. To all of my other friends out there, I want to tell you, if you get a knock on the door from the King of Kings, the General of Generals, the President of Presidents, uh, open the door for him because you will be happy that you did. Thanks, guys.